Salutations and welcome to Monomythic. I'm Kevin Garcia, and I always introduce myself as a professional comic book historian, and this is true. I've been paid by Marvel to research comics. I've also researched comics as a postgrad, and I, and I teach it in high school sometimes. But I have with me today two people that are way more knowledgeable about comics than I am. So uh, let's introduce them. First, we have Jess Nevins who is renowned as a Victorian sci-fi and fantasy expert. He's also the writer of The Evolution of the Costume Avenger, The 4,000-Year History of the Superhero, and most recently, Horror Fiction in the 20th Century, Exploring Literature's Most Chilling Genre, among other books. Uh, Jess, welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I also have with us uh, Mike Ficarra, who has illustrated books like the... Uh, Green, World Grey, and King Me, and he's been a key part of the official handbook of the Marvel Universe for over 15 years. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Kevin. Good to be here. So we're talking today about what it means to be a comic book historian, uh, what it means to uh, study comics on a uh, scholarly level, but at the same time, we want to look back at the overview of the history of comics, where they come from and where, they, where they're going, that kind of a thing. Um, People in the comments, if you would like to ask questions or make suggestions about things we need to mention, pop them in there. But first, I want to start with you. Uh, Jess, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started as a researcher in both comic books and superheroes? It was in grad school. Um, I was taking a, a grad program in culture, American culture studies, and one of the things that really intrigued me was applying all this theory that I was learning about to one of my long held passions, which was superhero comics. And so I started doing research and writing papers about that. Um, and then once I got out of grad school, I just kept doing it. And when the internet, well, World Wide Web, really took off, I was fortunate enough to put my annotations to the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen online, and then I attracted a, some fans who continued to support me no matter what I did. So that's the short version of how I got involved. That's actually how I heard about you as well. I remember reading your annotations early on. You also did... Um, in uh, back when GeoCities was a thing, you had a website where you tracked like uh, pre Fantastic Four Marvel characters that have never really been touched on again, and and another one of, of like public domain characters. Um, which uh, speaking of pre Fantastic Four Marvel characters and stuff, Mike, uh, tell us about yourself. How did you become a professional researcher where you would actually uh, do this uh, professionally, looking into comics? Sure. Um... Well, my, my passion for Marvel Comics dates back to when I was a child growing up in, uh, in Queens, New York. As a uh, little nerdy, bespectacled um, uh, a kid, I naturally gravitated towards Spider-Man. And I would uh, clip out all the newspaper strips in the, in the Daily News into a notebook. And I was a, pretty much a fanatic. And so when the internet came up and... Um, there was only a few strands of webs on the World Wide Web in around 1992. I discovered uh, spiderfan.org, uh, run by a fellow named uh, Jonathan Cooper from New Zealand. And uh, I began to contribute on Spiderfan, uh, doing profiles of characters uh, similar to the fashion of the official handbook of the Marvel Universe that I had grown up with. So it gave me a chance to profile characters um, with a, a worldwide um, audience. Um, and I reviewed some, some issues here and there. Um, then in the early 2000s, I think it was 2003, Marvel knocked on Jonathan's door and asked him if he would want to help Marvel write an encyclopedia of Spider-Man. They were looking for help from um, experts uh, who knew stuff back into the 60s and the 70s. And um, it was a huge effort, and Jonathan needed help. So a bunch of us all chipped in to help him with writing the profiles for the encyclopedia and, and proof it. Um, and um, so I got in the special thanks there, which was a huge thrill. And then the next year, um, our editor, Jeff Youngquist, said, um, how about we restart the official handbooks again? And who on this team would like to continue? And so I rose my hand and said, sure. Uh, so my first book was uh, Official Handbook of the Marvel Universe 2004 for the Spider-Man book. 
Um, so I got to write a bunch of profiles for that. And then the following year in the 2005 Spider-Man book. And I've been doing that kind of research ever since. Um, our team is writing handbooks to date. And we are online on, on call for Marvel when questions arise and they need us to look something up. How often do you get calls to to actually do research back into the old issues and old characters? Uh, I feel like there's always a question that's on our plate for us to look up. Um, there's, you know, sometimes it's, can you guys dig into and make a list for us of the following things? Um, you know, uh, 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 they'll make a spreadsheet for us of um, magical characters. Or they'll say... Um, well, we didn't know at the time, but during the uh, purchasing of Marvel by Disney, we were getting asked questions saying, can you make a list of the various families? So who's in the Fantastic Four family? Who's in the Guardians of the Galaxy family? Okay, so we were just putting together characters. Why? We didn't know. Uh, later on, we found out they were taking inventory of who their, their characters were and kind of blocking them into these families for the, all the legal reasons. Um, so questions like this pop up here and there. Um, um, right now I'm working on a certain villains list that editorial asked us to put together. Um, so it seemed like there's always something for us to work on. I remember when the uh, Disney purchase was about to happen, uh, Joe Quesada uh, and others would go on interviews and say, Marvel has 9,000 characters. Marvel's 9,000 characters. And they turned to the handbook team and said, can you count our characters and show <laughs> right. what the 9,000 characters are? And it was basically just a matter of, well, what counts as a character? You know, Peter yeah. Parker, obviously. Aunt May, I could see an Aunt May movie. The guy that was his roommate for two months in the 70s, probably not. You know, so <laughs> it was just, it, it was a neat way to, to, to do that. Yeah. Um, which uh, brings me to what I wanted to ask you guys. Um, is comic book historian a, a valid profession? Is this a valid form of academic study? Uh, Jess, uh, you, you, like I said, done this academically a lot. Is, was there any pushback? to doing comics or superheroes as a field? No, because I always made the argument that comic books are a medium, not a genre, and that superheroes are a genre just like movies, just like science fiction, just like horror. And nobody ever quarrels with a film historian who specializes in film noir. Well, I was specializing in superhero comics, and I don't see why anyone would object to comic book historian as a profession. If you can get paid for it and make a living wage, great. There are not a lot of us out there, but if you can do it, that's that's wonderful. Uh now that you mention it, I don't know about you, Mike, but I think a lot of the researchers uh, have other jobs as well. I know I was always a teacher, and then I would do mm -hmm. the researching on the side. I enjoyed doing it, but, you know. Um, That's right. This isn't a, um, a living wage job for me. This is a, a, a fun freelancing opportunity um, to do some more creative, fun stuff. I'm, a, I'm an engineer by, by day, and I, and I do this stuff, uh, you know, for, for fun and for uh, at, at the evenings. Um, yeah, if, to make this a full-time job, you know, doing what we do would be rather difficult. I know there was a time when Marvel did have uh, Peter Sanderson employed as their mm -hmm. official, uh, you know, chronology expert. And he was a person people went to to understand the facts and make sure everything made sense and flowed. Um, so there's nobody, I believe, in that position anymore. But, you know, they have us to, to tap with questions still. Well, let's uh, let's touch base on the, the scholarly aspect of it for a second. Um, Jess, you wrote a book called the uh, the four thousand year history of the superhero, and this is something that I've talked about a lot. Whenever I've I've done talks about this as well, where I will tie in the idea of Gilgamesh as being like what well, it is the oldest story we still have an original copy of, where it's you know there's a story with characters and everything happening, and we we still have four thousand year copies of it. Um, and it, he's basically a superhero. He's got an origin. He's got an ending. He's got adventures. Um, uh, Jess, what do you think has led this superhero tradition to last so long in that sense? Superheroes are wish fulfillment figures, basically. And as civilization got more complex, our fantasies and wishes grew more pronounced. So 
when urban civilization really grew, you had stories about urban vigilantes. Um, I wrote in my book about Long Meg, or yeah, Long Meg, the um, uh, based on a real British woman in the early 17th century. Um, she was she was a real woman who was a criminal and pseudo vigilante, but in the fiction written about her, she was a real vigilante. And I, I just look at it as a way for people to project their uh, project their issues into a fictional space where it can be easily dealt with. So pure wish fulfillment, but that's a necessary escape valve for people as civilization grows more complex. And uh, when you mentioned writing stories about her, that was largely in things like Penny Dreadfuls and and, and those early uh, kind of kind of raunchy fiction stories that would often be printed pretty cheaply. They became pulps by the turn of the century. Um, there's something that I, I always call those kind of a precursor to comics where it's like you'd have art and story, although back then it was more text than drawing. Um, Mike, what do you think about this idea of, of superheroes as being part of this several thousand year tradition? Do you feel like that's an accurate way of putting it? Do you think that I know it's something that um, that some of the bigger writers have talked about in the past too? the idea that um, superheroes are basically modern gods. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I grew up. You know, with superheroes, and I also grew up as a fan of the like the, the Greek mythology and and looking at all the, the different characters and all their stories um, back then. And I don't know when the connection actually got made, but I think at some point I realized like, oh, this is the modern mythology. This this is relevant to what we have here. Instead of Mount Olympus, we have the Empire State Building. You know, we have um, things that are more tangible and relatable uh, for us in the superhero genre. Of again, like 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 you were saying, just the the wish fulfillment. Um, I just I, I just find it rather funny that as I you, you look at these characters and these 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 beings who you want to um, escape into, their lives aren't always something that you necessarily want to have if you really get into it. And <laughs> they're so um, downtrodden and, and beaten um, day after day. But I think there's something inspirational about their stories. Because, um, you know, so many of them are morality tales. You know, we, we get to see that um, good triumphs over evil and that, you know, justice prevails in the end. And even when you are pushed down and pushed down, um, there is the greater good is, is manifested and that, um, that it's inspirational, you know. Um, so it, it, it's, um, I guess, in the same way that many of the, the mythology of, like I said, like, of the Greeks were. Myth uh, um, morality tales and inspirational. I think they, the same thing is, can be said for the superhero stories. You know, it's funny. You mentioned uh, the morality tales and, and, and that, that good and evil. And uh, that makes me think about some of the earlier pulp heroes uh, when evil lurked in the hearts of men. <laughs> um, Jess, could you uh, tell us a little bit about the pulp era and how that kind of evolved the idea of the superhero? The pulp sprang out of the dime novels, which sprang out of, out of the novelettes of the 1840s. So basically you've got, by the 1920s and 1930s, you've got nearly a century of mass-produced, cheaply made, cheaply written popular culture, popular fiction, a lot of which features these fantasy characters. Of the pulps were the sort of ultimate, ultimate prose expression of it before comics came along. And the pulps emphasized adventure and s simple emotions strongly expressed and exotifying everything. It was fantasy fiction for people who needed fantasy fiction. It could be mysteries or adventure or science fiction or even proto-superheroes like The Shadow and, and Doc Savage and The Spider and all those. But it was feeding the masses what they wanted. There weren't a lot of, out, there weren't a lot of uh, outlets providing um, entertainment at the time. 
and so they were they were filling the space that uh, TV would later would later take up and and uh, comic books. I know the Shadow and the Spider and others also had those radio adaptations, and and that kind of fed into that mythology before they actually became comics. Uh, Mike, what were you going to say? I was curious, Jess, if who was the target audience back then of those um, of those pulps? Were they kids? Were they teenagers? Or was it a larger, wider audience? It was a larger, wider audience. Hmm. Um, it was a lot of adults and a lot of kids. It was um, largely a white audience, but uh, certain genres of pulps were very popular according to the sales receipts in places like Harlem and Chicago Southside. Um, it was fiction for ev- for everyone. Uh, some genres were more popular with some fields of, with some types of people than others. Western romance pulps were aimed at women, for example. Hmm. But Westerns were not just Western romances, but Westerns, period, were very popular with women. Um, and that's sort of the start of modern fandom, but that's another story. And yeah. so uh, think, it was It was just, yes. No, I was just going to say, when, when, you, when you talk about, um, earlier you said uh, comic books being a medium, not a genre. Um, I, I think about, you know, The Shadow as an example. The radio show of The Shadow was definitely aimed at kids, whereas the books of The Shadow, I think, had a much older audience. So the, the books being the, the pulp magazines and stuff. So that kind of like ties the idea where you'd have that same character, but kind of aimed slightly differently depending on who the who the audience is. A lot of times there were editorial dictates about what audience they were going to go for or whether they were going to go broadly. Uh, essentially... You had the slicks, which were magazines published on slick paper, and you had the pulps, which were magazines published on cheap wood pulp paper. And the slicks were more expensive, so there you go. So the pulps provided a cheap alternative for people who didn't have a lot of money. So yeah, wide audience. Um, One thing that uh, I think of when when I talk about pulps is the idea that Pulps would start off with this idea of being, you know, mostly, mostly print, mostly prose, but they'd have art along with them. And as comic books began to take off, it, it kind of transitioned where you'd have the artists and the writers who are doing these, these essentially cheaper stories, uh, but they'd swap places instead of being mostly writing and and a little bit of art, it'd become mostly art and a little bit of writing for the early comic books. Um, And I wanted to ask, that that 1930s and 40s era when uh, when you know superheroes were first kind of kicking off what do you guys think made those so successful at the time um for for people who are new to comics uh the 1930s and 40s comic books were selling correct me if i'm wrong you guys i've heard in the in the millions of copies uh I've, I've, the number i've heard often is like 2 million copies for a superman issue um which it would be not till the 90s that comics would get anywhere near those kind of numbers again um, what do you think made them so popular during that time? Mike, you want to go first? Yeah, yeah I kind of <laughs> wanted to take this with Mike on this one. Sure. I wasn't sure. Um, I, I think the, um, the state of the world after two world wars, after depression, after, you know, everyone's coming home and rebuilding their lives. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine what life was like. It wasn't that long ago, but, um, to, to see so much devastation and death, um, you know, what that does to the morale of the society, to, uh, you know, to your, your emotions coming home and trying to restart again. Um, I think it was <clears throat> a big desire, a cultural need of, of heroes to look up to. I think there was a lot of uh, war stories of, you know, war heroes, of, um, you know, tales of people who, who did brave, brave acts. But um, the thought of um, somebody who was um, larger than life, who can rise above it all and um, come and save today, like Superman in action in action comics, or somebody just so brilliant like Bruce Wayne in Detective, um, or Wonder Woman to have come along at the same time, um, was was really exciting and inspirational and and it filled a real a real hunger at that time. 
Um, I think we still have that hunger, but I think it was, um, it, it was, it was novel for them having the spandex clad characters basically doing what, like I was saying, the, the mytho mythological um, characters of Hercules or, or Gilgamesh did before. So they were, they were clever, I think, and, and, and the timing was right. Uh, Bill Phil, Bill Field, who's uh, watching us right now, he's he's a animator and also a bit of a comic book historian himself. He, he mentioned that his grandfather was really into pulps and also would get into the stories of heroes like Green Llama. Um, Jess, were there a lot of uh, cross pollination, I guess, between the pulps and the comics? Uh, was it uh, was it just uh, like a, a new thing? Did they was there a lot of back and forth? No, there was. Uh, very little. Martin Goodman had a, a little back and forth between his pulps and his comics, but uh, comics were purely viewed by pulp editorial staffs as competitors, and they weren't going to let their properties go and be used in in comics, especially because there were i i started an article but had to put it aside years ago on the number of gold age heroes who were ripoffs and lifts and copies of the pre-existing pulp heroes so i i think there was almost a animus by pulp people toward comic books because the comics and the creators of it were seen as predatory and sort of stealing all the good ideas that sort of thing i think they definitely stole some of the uh the the um i guess wind from their sails was one way of putting it uh because uh by the time you got to the mid 40s comics were doing those million dollar sales and and even uh marvel who, who was not at the time uh near DC status was still doing fairly well in the comics field. Um, and, and, and like you were saying with the pulps, there were also a variety of comics back then. There were uh, comics aimed at, at, uh, at young female audiences. There were comics that were more cartoon animals and like that, but the superhero still kind of held on for a little bit. Um, it, it, it waned toward the end of the 1940s. Um, Jess, what, what do you think in your research of looking at the history of the superhero what caused the hero to kind of rise, the superhero specifically to kind of rise and fall as at the, as the golden age was coming to an end? There's a lot of uh, theory. There are a lot of theories on that. I tend to think it was simply audience taste changing, but I think the idea of the decline of the superhero is a, is a little overstated. Um, you had superheroes making transition into film and radio. Um, so I think it wasn't that the culture was tired of superheroes. I think the culture was tired of superheroes in comics and wanted other things in comics. Um, the, the field the medium of comics started to move away from superheroes in 43 when you had more non-superhero comics debuting than superhero comics debuting. Um, comics as a medium were in great shape in the late 40s. Superheroes were appearing in film serials and radio. Um, it was just the genre's time to fade away to a limited degree. But even during the 50s, during the Wortham era, you still had superheroes debuting and such. You mentioned the Wortham era, and I was going to say, as comics were kind of going through that little bit of a transition period, that's when uh, the big the big one hit, I guess, for comics. Comic book uh, historians today and, and comic book fans, as, as they get more and more into the industry, learn about this at some point. Seduction of the Innocent is, is a book that gets a lot of attention, although... There was already, I think, a move before this book came out, and a, sesh, a really big one after, of this concept of uh, superheroes as being, and not superheroes specifically, but but comic books in general, superheroes uh, as part of that, uh, as being this negative influence on kids. Uh, Dr. Wortham, for those who don't know, uh, was a very respected psychologist who had actually done a lot of great work. Um, he'd argued against segregation, for example, um, but. 
his next big thing that he decided to go after was comic books. And uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've actually read this book. Um, I, I checked it out through Interlibrary Loan and, and I went to read it myself. And it is nuts. I think if you were to look at it today, uh, you would say that there's not any really valid research behind it. But at the time, a parent looking at this for the first time might, might really freak out. Um, Mike, um, you, you've heard the story a lot as well. What's your take on on this this era where the beginning of the comics code came in and, and that kind of stuff? Well, I haven't read the book. I know about it, and I know the the ramifications of it. Um, and I, so correct me if I'm wrong. My impression of it, the 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 targeting of the book was mostly about I thought the the horror genre, the the tales from the crypt kind of um, characters who did some really gruesome stuff that. I assumed that Wortham was trying to protect kids from seeing the severed heads and, and disembodied um, organs. Um, and well, that superheroes well, were kind of a, a casualty of that. Is that, is that correct? Uh, ki- kind of. I, 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 Wortham's stated goal going in was that he, as being, again, one of the nation's preeminent psychologists, had been, a, been given a chance to work with some of the most disturbed uh, juveniles of the time period that, that they had. So literally, he had case study after case study of Jane Doe and John Doe. And, you know, the kids were not given their real names, but their ages were like between 9 and, and 17 or 18. And, and he would talk to them about what they read. And he would say things like, all right, what did you read? And, and I read a story about uh, a man who, who murdered someone. And, and, and what did that make you want to do? It's like, well, when I saw uh, my little brother, I wanted to push him off the roof. And so he's literally talking to a, a little bit more than a dozen of some of the most disturbed student, uh, students, children uh, of that time period. And he saw that what they all had in common was they all read comic books. So maybe it's comic books that's making them evil. Um, and, uh, of course at the time, as we said earlier with the numbers, just about all kids that age in the U S were reading comic books. So the fact that these kids who were disturbed happened to be similar to other kids who were not trying to kill their little brothers, you know, they also read comics. Um, so he was looking at what is in these comics and yes, he did look at horror comics, but he also looked at superhero comics. He also looked at romance comics and saw them as being a bad influence. He saw, uh, humor comics as uh, even things like, uh, uh, you know, the cartoon violence you'd see. Uh, the, the famous uh, quote that people always use is that he described Batman and Robin as being the wish dream of two homosexuals, and that would be drawing kids into sin. Um, and, uh, and and I don't know how much Wortham himself gets credit for it, but but uh, following around this time period, as there was this fervor to, to get rid of comics, uh, there were actually mass burnings in some places of comics. And there's, there's, you can see old like footage of these, of, of people like getting so excited, like, yeah, we're getting rid of these horrible things. Um, Jess, uh, what, what's your take on that whole situation? Um, there's a very base interpretation, which is that it was all economic, uh, economically driven and that Wortham was a patsy, um, I don't know that I buy that, but it was it was a time of cultural tension, and one way that it expressed itself was in this hyper emotional, very shrill concern for the kids. What about the children? And so Wortham came along at the time and found his patsy and beat the patsy up for as much as he could and no. he got fame out of it and i'm oh, sorry no no he, he no sorry um he, uh, he 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 did get fame out of it um comics uh were, were threatened just as hollywood around the same time with government intervention of government control uh comic books reacted by creating what was called the comics code authority which was this little stamp shaped symbol that would go in the corner of, uh, of comic books for, for decades uh, that basically said that this has been cleaned. We are sure there's nothing bad in here. And that meant there could be uh, no outright murder, nothing sexual. There could be, uh, they had specific things like no drugs, no undead, no, uh, no occult. Um, if there's a bad guy, the bad guy must always be shown to be punished at the end. You could not have a story where the bad guy gets away with it. You could not have a story from the bad guy's point of view because he might be sympathetic. Um, and this led to, um, Ironically, I think, in my view at least, this led to this era of this pop 
comic book. Um, this led to some really silly comics in the 50s where DC, especially, but Marvel also to an extent, would would kind of go over the top with their characters and just be really, really goofy with them. Um, but that led to Batman the TV show with Adam West. And that led to um, people like Andy Warhol and stuff wanting to like kind of take off this idea of the superhero. And it became kind of pop, but silly. Um, and, and I think for a lot of fans, it was this idea that comic books were given this tinge of being for kids now. Um, Mike, uh, you, you, we were talking a little bit earlier. Is this something that, that uh, you feel kind of affected comic books as a, as a medium for a while, this idea that comic books had to be for kids? And, and, uh, and how did they get out of that? Yeah, I know they call like the 1980s the dark period of comics, but something I think the 60s might have been <laughs> with, the, um, with the, the campiness that, that, um, that ran through things. Um, I'm not really a fan of, of camp, but yet I did, as a child, like the Adam West Batman. I, I kind of grew up with it. Um, I, I remember seeing in the TV guide, it said uh, Batman comedy. I was like, this is serious stuff. What do you mean comedy? <laughs> <laughs> I was insulted. Um, no, but I think it was um, it was a transitional period. I think it was a time when the, the silliness had its moment and had its audience. People were okay with 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 uh, that genre. Um, I think it kind of ran its due. I think it kind of ran its course. Um, I think by the seventies, they still saw a lot of campiness on TV. Things like the Donnie and Marie show. I mean, there was still a lot of you know uh, knock knock jokes. You know, just things that I look back as like you know, wow, that was funny back then. I remember laughing. Um, but the comics I felt were starting to, to turn and that's when the comics code started to relax that stuff on horror and the undead and things like that. So there would seem to be this, the, the evolution started happening in the seventies with what was allowable. Um, I, I think you can only beat that horse so long and, 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 and the audience started aging, I think also following um, from the sixties and the more mature audience started to want more mature things and they weren't, tolerating the, the the silliness of the of the 60s camp uh, one of the, one of the first big uh pushes uh against this was actually uh, i mean stan lee is often credited with this but i think it's more than just stan lee that was the the first issue for spider-man uh, to not have the code on it um mike can you tell us a little bit about what happened with those the, that the famous spider-man 96 where uh spider-man was one of the first big comics to not be published with the code yeah um, so I've, I've heard Stanley tell his story and he said he was approached by various government officials. I don't know who these people were, but he said he was approached, um, to address the, um, the drug problem of, 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 of the, the of youth, um, and show it in a negative light. And he was unable to, his hands were tied because of the Congress code, um, but they made a decision to say, you know, we're going to, to tackle this issue. We're going to take the code off and let's see what happens. And he was willing to, to brave that, that risk. Um, so he did a story with, with Peter's, Peter Parker's um, best friend, Harry Osborne, um, getting involved with, with um, LSD and um, having a bad trip and um, having a, a near fatal incident. Um, so the code came off the it made headlines and the sales were great. Uh, you know, it didn't, didn't hurt Marvel. Um, if anything, it was, I think they came out as, as, as champions at the end, they said, you know, we took a risk and we're tackling a social issue. Um, the code came back on again afterwards. Um, but not without making a difference, making a change that, that affected everything since then. And the, uh, there was a, DC had uh, their drug issues in the early 70s with um, Green Arrow and Speedy. I don't know if that was the first, but that's the first I can recall, um, you know, t- tackling you know, the pretty serious subject. Yeah, they, they started relaxing their, their code after that. And, and, uh, and, and the code continued to gradually relax with each decade and each, each few years. But, um, but yeah, around this time, uh, superheroes started being presented, in the comic books at least, uh, in a much darker tone, you would have things like the the, the drug issues we talked about. There was uh, race, which became a real big factor in the Green Lantern Green Arrow series. Um, there was um, 
death that could finally happen where where ongoing characters would die uh very famously you know uh Gwen Stacy uh was was killed and this was something that was considered very shocking to to readers and and even supposedly to Stanley himself although story goes that Stan had approved it um mm-hmm. and then t- took it back later um uh, Jess you had said earlier that superheroes were this kind of wish fulfillment and i think uh in the uh especially the, the mid 40s and by the 50s it was a very clean wish fulfillment. It was like the heroes were all good. The villains were all bad. Um, but by the time you get into this period, you have a lot of things where it kind of sucks to be a hero. Um, do you think that 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 mythology concept of the hero has, has had evolved by this point? Did it did it change? Was it still this wish fulfillment? Um, I think part of it remained wish fulfillment. Um, but part of it was that audience, the audiences had different expectations out of their entertainment. And so you had film in the 70s, American film in the 70s, becoming much more complex and music becoming more complex and TV becoming more complex. And it was in superhero comics, I think it was just a case of the the genre being dragged by writers and editors into a place it hadn't gone before. You know, you mentioned movies in the, uh, the, the, the late seventies, uh, they were pushing for Superman to be in movies. And uh, there was a big pushback, this idea that Superman could not be a a wide release or it would be wide release, but it wouldn't be like wide audience. It'd be a kid's movie because superheroes are kids stuff. And I think comic fans at the time who were reading, uh, like Mike was saying a second ago, you know, the, the more gritty Batman that was being out with Denny O'Neill and other people, um, the, uh, the the X-Men with uh, Chris Claremont were have, having more, you know, emotional stories that were happening. Um, they were ready for it. But uh, until they could really believe a man would fly with Superman, it, it wasn't in that pop culture that superheroes could be for more than just kids. Um, uh, Mike, this is something you said you want to talk about earlier. When you, you were telling me that it was... Uh, kind of a psychological shift for comic books. What do you mean by that? I think what was happening in the stories, um, the the grittiness, the 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 realism, uh, worked its way in. Where um, you know we started seeing in the sixties. I think I, I think it was definitely there. And I mean, it's not that characters were completely flat for decades. I mean, there was always this the human element had to be present. Um, but when the Fantastic Four would bicker, you know, that wasn't this supreme uh, godly character who wasn't affected by anything and could just fly out into the universe to not be, to be hurt by anything. Um, you know, we had a character like Spider-Man who was catching colds and getting holes in his shoes um, and his girlfriend dies. I mean, that was just, just such a, a pivotal moment of, of, of crushing defeat for, you know, his, his main girlfriend, the lowest lane of the Spider-Man world to be, to be killed. Um, was 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 devastating and, and and shocking. I know the fans erupted, but at the same time, it's it's still looked at one as one of the greatest stories. So I think the shift is happening in, in this time period that, um, in becoming more gritty, in becoming more psychological, more um, more cerebral, <clears throat> the audience that grew up with it as as kids are maybe in their twenties or in their thirties or starting again their forties and they're looking for something a little more complex. So something like Craven's uh, last hunt comes along. You got a character who has been jungle boy up to now and, and maybe seemed a little, as a little silly is dressing like Spider-Man, eating spiders, reciting poetry and um, defeating the one animal for his perspective, the one hunt that he never was able to defeat. Um, man, it was, it was incredibly gritty. The Dark Knight was out. The Watchmen was out. Um, you know, one after another, everything got very heavy and cerebral and, and intellectual and, and thought-provoking. Um, I remember the, the, the issue of uh, Mike Mantlo, um, Bill Mantlo's Hulk with Mike Mignola drawing it um, dealt with the source of Bruce Banner's rage. He was abused as a child. Whoa, his mother was, was abused. I mean, it, it, all this stuff was buried in him. And he actually was in this place called the Crossroads where his inner psyche had manifested as psychological constructs. Um, it was just it was mind-blowing. Um, 
so the yeah, I think I think the audience was maturing and the the stories were maturing and, and differentiating. I think some of the first Marvel comics that I read, um, not the very first, but some of the first ones that I read were uh, Starlin's uh, Thanos and and Adam Warlock stories, and and they were just very much these psychological trips of like, what is the meaning of existence? And it just, you know, blew my blew my little kid mind. Um, <laughs> but um, but something else was happening around this time of the '80s that that I want to draw this back to at the beginning of our conversation, which was. Um, studying the history of comics, and that is uh, there was a real push uh, towards continuity, this push towards tracking the history of the superheroes. Uh, you were brought in, Mike, specifically to show the history of Marvel, as you guys, your team, not, not you by yourself, but the team you were part of, uh, were brought in to make the official handbooks of the Marvel Universe. And uh, and just as you would research things, a lot of what people would go to for you was this idea of, oh, where were th- how are things connected? Where does everything come from? Uh, Mark Grunewald uh, famously uh, uh, spearheaded the official handbook project in the in the '90s, or sorry, '80s rather, and they would go into intense detail about what it, what it took to be a superhero and make them real, but also at the same time trace their history. Uh, DC around this time, up to this point, had been kind of fast and loose with their with their stories. Maybe they connect, maybe they don't. But after uh, Crisis and Infinite Earths, everything you no know, everything counts now. Everything from here on out. It counts, you know. Um, uh, Jess, uh, as somebody who studied uh, superheroes from from more of a of a, a history point of view, um, does this idea of continuity come into play when you are when you're studying it? Is it more of, of the overview that you're looking at, or do you actually trace the the origins of characters in their own storyline as, as well? Um, when continuity is relevant. Uh, I've done a fair amount of research into continuity as a storytelling tool used back in the Nick Carter stories of the 1890s and 1900s, when continuity was actually a thing and was important. Um, so if if continuity matters to what I'm writing about, I will do research on that. But usually I'm more interested in character concepts and who's influencing which portrayal of which character at the time. But it, it matters. It depends on what I'm writing about really. Usually the bigger picture. Uh, Mike, there, there's, I've heard a debate among writers of comics and also critics uh, of whether or not continuity is vital. That some people say, no, if you have a good story to tell, just tell it. Don't worry if it matches earlier stories. Other people say, no, if you're going to tell a good story, build off what came before. Um, I, I feel like you're, you would have a bias for this because you work for the handbooks, but, but what do you think about that idea? Do you think um, this, this uh, where, where continuity used to be kind of used with some of the older stories, like Jess was saying in the 1800s and, and the early 20th century, now it's, it's ingrained into... The, the culture of comics. What do you think about that idea? Is this good? Is this bad? Well, I, I am biased. As, <laughs> as a handbook guy, you know, I want to see everything connect. I want to see everything make sense. And, and it, it drives me crazy when I have a, a plot hole that I have to fill with uh, some verbal spackle to try to figure out what, how this connected to here and mesh together in a, in a seamless storyline. And uh, there are times when it just, it, you can't figure it out. Um, so the problem is with the, the the growing audience. I mean, I think soap operas face this this problem of the dilemma of this long continuing storyline and trying to keep it interested and, and all well connected. Um, so you have your audience that's been reading for a long time. You want to respect them. You want to honor them for being with you for the long run. And then you got the new kids coming in here who just want to pick up the book for the first time, and they don't want to get bogged down in all this this history that they can't jump into that quickly. You know, not everybody wants to go read a handbook with a six-point font to find out how everything all connects together. Um, so, you know, if I was an editor, editor-in-chief, you know, and trying to look at my new audience today, I know I'd be really struggling with, with this problem. You know, I would like to see both happen at the same time. Have continuity, but not let it be burdensome. Um, you can have in one-shot stories that don't have to tie into the continuity, and they're great. You can have an Elseworld stories, you know, a, a what if story that just throws continuity to the wind and can still be interesting and exciting. You can have like the exiles popping around from universe to universe. Um, so I like, I ideally, 
that you do both. That you, you know, you, you don't make it be such a burden, but you can have the little yellow box at the bottom with the little asterisk saying, see issue 157 for where this all connects together. So if you care, you can go back and look. And if you don't care, you just keep going. So I think that's the art. One of our viewers, Alexander Garcia, asked, you know, about alternate reuniverses in comics or also it was all a dream. And and it's kind of funny because DC in, in the 60s was very big on this idea of of they do a whole comic where that comic would just be it, it's it's a uh, it, this whole comic was a dream by the end of it. You find out, oh, it was a dream. Or at the end of it, there'll be a little editorial note saying this didn't actually happen. But what if it did? Um, and then it's funny because when I was working with the handbook team, um, you'd get a lot of this idea that. No, even the dreams count because the dream <laughs> really did happen somewhere in the multiverse. That's right. So even the dreams are in continuity. Um, there, there is a reality number for the dream that showed up in this issue. It, it, because somewhere in the universe, that's what happened to Peter Parker, or that's what happened to Kitty Pride, and that's right, and that kind of a thing. Um, uh, you, you mentioned earlier that your first comic uh, handbook, rather, that you were an official writer on, was. Uh, Spider-Man 2004. My first one with the group team was the uh, Marvel Mystery Handbook in 2009. I was with the team for about 10 years. And the, the Golden Age was always just a big thing for me. I loved that idea of these of these histories counting. Uh, that's kind of, a, a, as a fan, where I, I kind of put Marvel above DC a little bit, is that I would see that um, whereas DC did have a history, they would have to retcon it every few you know years to decide how it works. And Marvel was doing that too. But Marvel was doing it in the sense that we're going to retcon it so it still counts. So they were trying to find a way. Okay, wait, how was Captain America active in the 50s? We said he was in the ice. We're going to find a way to make it count. All right? <laughs> so uh, wait, how did Red Skull go to hell in 1947? Uh, okay, we're going to find a way to make that still work. And and so there, I love this idea of, of everything counts. It's all connected. Um, uh, uh, Jess, back to you for a second. Um, since you are looking at the big picture... Um, do those uh, just a dream comics uh, affect that? Do retcons hurt or help or not make a difference at all in your research? Uh, what do you think about those ideas of, of these alternate takes on the history? Um, I, I th they don't really affect my writing because the the alternate takes and the else worlds and what ifs and all that they're playing on the archetypal form of the character. So it's the, the core elements of Captain America are always going to be Captain America, even if Sharon Carter is wearing the mask and carrying the shield. So um, they're interesting to note and they're fun to read, but as far as what I'm writing about no, it doesn't really affect it. Um, you know, you know, it's funny you mentioned the archetypal thing. Um, the, the, I've given talks before about this idea of the archetype, archetype of the superhero, and um, when I talk about it, I talk about superheroes and, and this idea that it's been around for for decades, and you have all these different writers, you know, being part of it. Uh, Bill Field uh, just mentioned here that Roy Thomas had to take what Stanley did and, and tie it into history. Um, I, I look at that and I say this is what makes it modern mythology because. In, in ancient history, you had oral tradition and you would hear a story and you would tell it. And when you tell the story, you might embellish a part of it that you thought was more interesting or you might leave out a part you thought was boring. Um, and over time, you have this kind of this kind of uh, gestalt myth uh, myth that gets developed of like all the good pieces. And uh, and I was using Superman as an example of that in that Superman's story has been told, you know, in comics and radio, in, in cartoons and film. Uh, and, and each one kind of adds or takes different things. And we as a society, if you ask people, you know, who is Superman's girlfriend? They know. If you ask what happened to Superman's dad, they go, oh, he died. Uh, and, and whether they're thinking of uh, the, uh, the recent movie or they're thinking of the cartoon series. Well, I don't think he didn't die in the cartoon. Or you're thinking of the, the comics from, from the older days or you're thinking of the movie. That idea of Superman's dad dying became part of something we held on to. Um, so it's like we as a society kind of – look at the parts of the hero's story that we liked and just kind of hold on to that. So even if the retcons have changed and even if the stories have evolved, we still kind of hold these parts to be that is who the hero is in our head. And it becomes kind of this modern oral tradition. Jess, you look like you want to jump in on that one. Well, yes, but uh, I think it can't be forgotten that 
the two main corpuses, corpi, corpuses, corpus, uh, of myths that we had, both were synthesized by a central figure. You had the Greek myths with Hesiod, and then you had the Viking myths with Snorri Sturluson. And so it it the myths evolve naturally, but they're also shaped. Guided. And that's where I, I'd say Snorri Sturluson was the Stan Lee of 13th century Iceland, for example. <laughs> well, wow. That's a tagline. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mike, what do you think about that idea that, that you'd have a central figure, Stanley, for many years at Marvel, uh, that kind of guides and, and, and controls? I know this is also a factor for other shared universes like uh, Star Trek, for example, where they'd have somebody or a group of people that would be in charge. Uh, do you think that's true, that that's helped uh, shape as well that our, our, as, a, as a public's idea of what these heroes are? Uh, having a central character like a Roddenberry or a Stanley, I think, has really helped move comic books from um the kids rack to what it is today you know where it's everywhere it's on every bed sheet and pillowcase you know um and the movie screens you know so i think that process was greatly helped by having a a personality to to uh, to centralize that no dc didn't have i don't think they're stanley you know so much that with one central person um, but their characters themselves were those personalities. I think their their core Justice League were able to propel them into everyone's everyone's homes and everyone's hearts. Um, but I think you know Stanley was that momentum that that rocket on on Marvel that you know moved along, and everyone just um, adored his his appearances and his and his his uh, his character. Um, so it was definitely a a help. Yeah. You know, I want to ask one last question and then we can uh, wrap this up for today because I've, I've really been enjoying this conversation. And that is, um, we've been talking all this time about the history of superheroes and the history of comic books and how they've kind of evolved over time. And I want to ask, where do you think they're going? Where do you hmm. think um, comic books and uh, superheroes a, as, a, as an idea are, are going to go from today's world based on the yeah. stuff that we see around us? Um, Jess, to start with you. What do you think? What do you think is the future of superheroes? I think it's bright. I think people are always going to need wish fulfillment characters. Um, I think they're going to increasingly reflect society as a whole, which means there will be a lot more people of color, superheroes of color, a lot more women. um, But I, I think as long as the movies make so much money for the companies the movies are going to be, in a respect, the the prime mover behind the comics. Um, if the f- movie fad and superheroes are and then it will be back to the writers and editors. But maybe that's a, too cynical a take. Mike, how about you? What do you think? Where do you think we're going uh, now in the future? It, it's over, Kevin. This is it. This is the end. <laughs> it's... <laughs> I hear that with the movies, you know, it's, oh, this the superhero business is going to be gone in a year or two, and um, you know, it it isn't a single genre. You know, I think um, we're going to keep keep telling stories. I think we're going to see familiar characters being, you know, reintroduced in different ways and cool different ways. Um, what I'm really looking forward to are who are the new characters coming up in the next few decades? Who are the new Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Spider-Man, Hulk, Thor, you know, um, you know, this, this wave of originality, you know, happened and it's certainly going to happen again. We haven't run out of music. We haven't run out of stories. We're going to keep creating stuff. Humans are, are creative beings. And I think we're going to be surprised at what's new and what's next. And um, we'll keep figuring out new ways to be entertaining and inspiring. Yeah, I, I agree with both you guys. Uh, with, with what Jess was saying, I totally agree. I think that comics have been trying for the past several decades to increase diversity, but I think it's become a, a bigger push, and I think it will be a bigger push as comics become a bigger, trying to reach that wider audience. Um, I think that's a very important thing. And, and uh, I know with the MCU, for example, all their original movies were you know white male heroes, 
Uh, and then they started diversifying. And then we're going to get more of that as things go. Um, the um, and, and then what uh, what Mike was saying is that uh, it's not just one genre and something that, that Jess said at the very beginning. And honestly, I would love to see the movies do that. They've already been. What if superheroes were were a space opera? Uh, let's see now. What if superheroes were in the old west? I'd love to see them do a two gun uh, kid, you know, movie. Uh, what if superheroes were horror? Uh, supposedly the New Mutants movie is supposed to be a little bit of that, but I'd love to see. And then also the Doctor Strange movie, apparently the sequel. Right. I don't know. I, I think I think it'd be really great to have that. Well, with that, I, I think we're going to have to uh, to wrap it up a bit. I want to thank both of you guys so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And with that, I want to say thank you for being in our audience. Thank you for listening to Monomythic. We've been doing these mostly every week. Uh, we took a few weeks off because uh, we thought it was very important, uh, given everything going on in the world, uh, not to try to mix in with those voices that needed to be heard. Um, but we're going to try to continue being weekly uh, from here on out with uh, different talks each week. Uh, once again, thank you all for coming and keep making myths. <laughs>